about halfway there. We're just saying that he's off to a nice start. Why does it have to be all or nothing all the time? Like, what am I doing? I'm doing it for the show. Field of 68 till I die. This is the Field of 68 After Dark Show, the only place that you need to be for college hoops every single night. Welcome to the Wednesday evening edition of the Field of 68 After Dark here on Sirius XM Channel 84. That is the ESPN News Station. We are streaming over on YouTube. If you're watching there, please hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, jump in the chat, ask us some questions. My name is Rob Doster. We are presented by our partners over at Bet River Sportsbook. Remember, we still have our pool open at bracketfanatics.com. Find a link in the description below. You can use the code FIELD when you sign up. It is free to enter. There is a $500 prize. Pool and you could put your picks up against Jeff Goodman's. I promise you are probably going to end up beating him. We have plenty to get into tonight, guys. The NCAA tournament starts in full tomorrow. It is officially Christmas Eve, so I am thrilled to be joined by Oklahoma State head coach Mike Boynton. So thrilled, in fact, that I will tolerate the presence of stadiums Jeff Goodman. Mike, thanks for being here, man. How you doing? Rob, I'm doing great, man. How are you? I'm always good, Mike. I'm always good. It's March, baby. I'm ready to go. Jeffrey, you are in a hotel room in Buffalo. You have not been kidnapped. You are not taken hostage, correct? Hey, Mike, this is the most dressed up Rob has ever been in the show. So I think he's trying to impress you or something. I, I don't know. Rob's a good man, man. We, uh, we, we got connected a couple of years ago and stayed in touch. And uh, I'm glad he landed on his feet. And this thing's going well. I'm happy for him. It's it's going well because we're able to get uh, guests like you on here, not because of Jeff Goodman. But listen, uh, I do I do want to talk to you about the Big 12. You did coach in that league this year. You probably know it better than Jeff or I do. Uh, so I, I want to start out with this. You obviously you had a, a, an unfortunate season, right? You guys were ineligible for the postseason, which uh, was a difficult thing to deal with, I'm sure. I'm curious. I mean, look, your guys fought to the end. You had an upset win over Baylor. Um, you guys played hard at the end of the year when you really had nothing left to play for. I'm just kind of curious. Like, what did you learn about your team? What did you learn about your program? What did you learn about yourself over the course uh, of the last four or five months? Well, I, I would say this. And I'll try to be a little brief, but I'm glad that I had really good kids in our program uh, because it could have went really south and got really ugly really early for us. Um, yeah, you know, I've been doing this now for 18 years, and this was by far and away the, the most challenging uh, my time has been in coaching. So we're dealing with 18 to 22 year old kids primarily, right? And we're, we're everybody's excited right now because this is what college basketball is all about. Everything we do, how we train in the summer, recruiting, scheduling is about having an opportunity to be on the stage over the next three weeks, and you know, how you keep your guys motivated to stay connected, you know, because so much of the outside noise outside of your locker room is about, you know, getting your stats, making sure you get enough playing time now, right? Are you getting NIL deals? Um, whatever the case may be, what, what's your pro stock, you know, stop, stop look like, you know, ESPN has a guy come on that seems like every game to talk about who's getting drafted first. I mean, and, and I like Mike, right? He does a good job, obviously. But I think there's a time and place for everything. We, we've taken everything that's supposed to be good and pure about being a part of a team and made it secondary. And so as coaches, we're all fighting this battle every day to say, hey, listen, if we have a good year, we can be playing in the greatest tournament that there is. For the next three weeks, have an opportunity to compete for a national championship. So on November 1st, <laughs> when we hear that's off the table for us, like, like, what do you do every day for the next seven months? <laughs> like, what are you playing the season for? What are you practicing? What are you lifting weights for? What are you asking guys to come back? Pride, and, pride, right? Absolutely. You got to appeal to that. Uh, and, and like I said, from the beginning, you got to hope that they're good enough kids that they can withstand, right? The noise, because we still are going to have struggles. We went on a four game losing streak in the middle of January. Like what, that could have really went crazy for the last six months, six weeks of the season. Uh, but I'm thankful I had a good staff, really good kids, and we got through it. Hope I never have to, you know, experience anything else like that again. And uh, I'm, I'm just glad, like I said, that we were able to learn. We finished 15 and 15, but we finished fifth in the Big 12. Well, obviously, I, I think the best league in the country, uh, eight wins in that league. And we beat everybody in the league except Kansas. 
once. Uh, they swept us. We, we went, you know, we split with everybody else. Uh, so all in all, uh, with everything considered, I think it was a good year, obviously below the expectations I have for myself or the program. But I think we'll have a chance to bounce back and learn from this and be better moving forward. All right. So the big question I have for you in the Big 12, like you said, you think I know your answer since you got swept by Kansas and nobody else. But what is the Big 12 team that you feel like is the most dangerous? We, we've had these conversations all year and, and it's been split. You know, some people say Kansas, some people say Baylor, some people say Texas Tech. Those are the three really that it's been split between. What's the team that you're taking that has a chance to go, the, that will go the furthest in the NCAA tournament? Yeah, and, you know, I apologize. I haven't studied the bracket, so I don't know everybody's path, but just from being through the league and, and watching them, knowing what they have, I, I would say Kansas. You know, it starts with, it's, it's about players, man. Like, they have the best player in our league. Yeah. He's the first team All-American for a reason. And then they have a Hall of Fame coach. Like, he's been there. He's done it. He's done it for two plus decades. Um, and so there won't be anything that comes up in this tournament that he won't be prepared for. Right. Uh, I went through it last year, coaching in the tournament for the first time, just the quick turnarounds, the adjustments, playing against guys you're not used to having scouting reports ready made for you. And obviously the staffs work really hard, but it's like, you know, it's cramming for the final exam. <laughs> like, yeah. You stay up all night and you hope that you got enough play calls from somebody in the league that they're right still and, and that you get a chance to, to get somebody playing well. But I would say Kansas, the experience, you know, having a star player, the size, I think they shoot it well, well enough. And if they get Mitch Lightfoot and um, and Remy Martin both to contribute the way they did in the Big 12 tournament, um, that, that'll make that yeah. that'll make me more convinced that they can win it all. What is it about Bill that makes him – so difficult to, to coach against is so difficult to game plan against. I'll say this. Most coaches are really, really committed to what they believe in. Mark Adams, in my opinion, is a great example of that. Yeah. Mark Adams was really good this year because he is convicted in how he wants to play basketball. He's not second guessing himself. He knew he didn't have, you know, a true star coming into the year. He's got a bunch of different pieces. His Juco background helped him there. Right. But he was convicted that if we just are really good defensively, we'll give ourselves a chance. I think they played Tennessee in the garden like early in December and, and both teams went like, you know, half the game without making a basket. <laughs> it, it was an awful and, basketball game to watch. It was awful. And, and he didn't care. He didn't, didn't care. care. He loved it. Right. This, yeah. Like get on the plane and win 39, 35. <laughs> like, um, Bill, on the other hand, he's comfortable adapting game by game, half by half, four minute to four minute media timeout. You know, he'll play zone if he has to. He'll go boxing one, trying on two. Uh, we beat him last year when we had Cade. And the only time all year he played a trying on two was against us. Really? We had him down like 16, you know, and Cade, as good as he was, he was a freshman. He didn't see that a whole lot. Right. <laughs> but he's still trying to drive in there. He's got the whole lane clogged up. <laughs> But that's what Bill does. He, he's going to figure out how to put his team in position to win based on what they need to do that day. And, Mike, Sean, Sean Miller says Bill Self is the best coach in college basketball. I, I agree. I agree. I think he's the best guy. Certainly the total package, right? He does it all well. He's really good in the media, public relations, fundraising, yeah. clearly recruits at a high level. You know, and, and then the end game adjustments is, is a real thing. I mean, people kind of, you know, boo-hoo at that. But you, you, A, have to know the X's and O's, and then you have to be able to have your guys executed. Right. And no, those things don't always go together. Uh, but he's, he's as good as anybody at it. I mean, everybody in our league knows coming out of timeouts, they're going to probably look for a backdoor lob, and they get it every game. <laughs> <laughs> they do. It's ridiculous. Ridiculous. Uh, I want to I want to ask you about Baylor and Scott Drew. Uh, you probably had as much success against them as anybody did in college basketball this season. You beat them once. Uh, I believe that that was uh, it at your place. And then um, when you played at Baylor, you took them to overtime. So uh, was that just was that a matchup thing? 
Uh, was that down to the, the the brilliant coaching on the sideline for Oklahoma State that game, or or you know what what happened in those games? And, and talk to uh, me a little about Baylor. Uh, and Scott's a really really good friend, really good friend of mine. A lot of respect for him. What he's done at Baylor, I mean, there should be a movie made about it. There will be. There will be. Mm-hmm. I mean, seriously, considering what that program was when he took over to where it is now, literally one of the premier programs in in what we believe is certainly the best league. Uh, we actually. I, beat I, I don't. I don't mean to cut you off, but I, since we're talking about a Scott Drew movie, I need you both to answer this question. If you were going to have one actor play Scott Drew in the Baylor movie, who would it be? Goodman, I'm going to you first on this one. I'm putting you on the spot because I got my guy. You know who it's got to be? Go ahead. I haven't thought about this. Jason Sudeikis, the guy that played Ted Lasso. Have you guys seen Ted Lasso? Oh yeah, yeah. That's a good one. That's a good one. Of course, it's got to be him, you right? See Ted. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a, he's goofy. He's kind of dorky. Uh, but he embraces his his kind of goofiness, doesn't he? Yeah, exactly. That's All right, awesome. go ahead. I'm sorry, Mike. I didn't mean to cut no, you no, off. No, 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 <laughs> no. Uh, we we actually beat them in Waco this year. Um, they were number one. They had just lost to uh, Tech, so they lost two games in a row right. that week. They were number one. We beat them on that Saturday, uh, and then we actually we we. I feel like, obviously, we should have won the game in, in Stillwater. Uh, they got us in overtime, but we played well enough. I think the thing with us, I think our length bothered them. Um, their, their guards are smaller, uh, yeah. and they're, they're, they're dribble heavy. They like to create off, create off the bounce. They don't move it as much or as well as they did when they had four pros back there last year. Um, and so I, I think that just, just our length has, has bothered them over the course of time. Uh, we played them two good games last year. We actually lost to them twice, but then beat them in a conference tournament uh, with K. But um, we've had some great games against those guys over the course of the time. But they, they've always, you know, he's another one. He's learned, I think, in my time. When we played the first two years, he played nothing but zone. I don't know if he's played 15 uh, possessions of zone in the last two years. Now, last year, he didn't need to play zone because he had two guys. He could put out there to guard anybody you put on the floor. And Davian Mitchell and Mark Vidal. So <laughs> there was no need to have those two dudes sitting in the zone for 40 minutes. Um, how, how much do you worry about them this this tournament, Mike? Because they are thin. I mean, LJ Cryer uh, in News Broken by uh, our own Talia Goodman is out for this weekend. So he's not playing in either game. They're leading score. They've got balance. They've got six other dudes that can all hurt you. But how, how much – when you're down to six guys and the seventh is a D2 transfer who didn't play a ton this year, he's been good when he came in. How, yeah, how much confidence do you have that they're, they're going to be able to run off four, you know, four straight and get to the final four? Yeah, that's a great question. Now, I would just say if, if I'm Scott Drew, I'm just trying to get through the weekend. Right. And I'm right. trying to get that dude yeah. as much treatment as possible. I don't know who their games are this weekend, but you, know, you hope. Hope you can get through as a one seed the first two games, right? And then you get you got another week. You bought yourself another week to get him healthy. But I, I'll say this: he's been out a while, and they've adjusted, yes. playing yes. better without him. Um, Kenjo's been really dynamic for him. Um, Flagler's Flagler. been really, really good. He, he wasn't great in the Big Twelve tournament, which is a big part of the reason they lost. I only think he scored two points against Oklahoma when they when they lost. Um, their two freshmen are really, really good. Sohan and Kendall Brown, they're kind of unsung. They don't need the ball to make an impact on the game. Right, that's right. They both rebound, they defend, you know, they're really, really good players. And then, you know, I worry about their depth up front more than anything. So when you get into the Sweet 16 Elite Eight, right, next weekend, I worry about who they'll see then and whether they'll be able to get through with just having yeah. – um, I can't even think of his name. The big kid, flow, that, that flow, yeah, flow, 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 just, flow. Yeah, and he's a good player, but but he doesn't have a backup right now. So him, so him. Yeah, they were their, playing their Sohan. Class. Yeah, right, right. But you know, you mean you yeah. know Sohan and against Kofi. I, you know, I don't know if I want to <laughs> put Jeremy Sohan. On you don't want to see that. No, you don't want to see that if you're sketcher or anything close to that. <laughs> you're right. So we we've talked a lot on this show about Texas Tech and some of the concerns we have. Uh, and that they don't necessarily have a great lead guard, right? I think of the tournament settings, being able to have someone you could just give the ball to and know, all right, look, we can't run everything. Uh, these guys know our defense are too well scouted, this, that, and the third. You go make a play, right? They don't really have that guy. Does that does that concern you at all with them long-term, or is this just a group that is so tough and so connected they're going to find a way to figure it out? 
I think they'll figure it out early in the tournament. Again, I think part of it is when you get to the next weekend. You know, again, I think they'll be okay this weekend. I really do. Um, they need they need Kevin McCullough healthy. I, I don't know how healthy he is. We beat him in the last regular season game this year. He did not play. I think that was a big factor. Um, he's been a really, really steady influence there because he's a great decision maker. He's not a true point guard, but he really, really – he plays so under control. It allows Adonis Arms, TJ Shannon, those guys can get a little out of, you know, out of kilter at times. But he also knows when they need to throw the ball into Bryson Williams. And when he's on the court, he can make sure that the ball gets to Bryson when he's had it, has a matchup that he can take advantage of. He's really, really good. I think he maybe was one of the more underrated guys in our league. Uh, but you talk about a matchup problem because he can guard your five, your five can't guard him. Right. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about some of these other teams in the league. Iowa State uh, started out great, um, kind of came back to earth a little bit. TCU, I think it was kind of the opposite, right? They didn't have a great start to the season, but they ended strong and they beat Kansas towards the end of the year. And then Texas just seems like they were kind of floating around, you know, that, that, that top 20 range. I think they were like in the 15 to 20 range on Ken Palm the entire season. Uh, do, you, do you see any of those three teams being able to string, string together two, three, four wins in this tournament? You know, Brockington from Iowa State um, is an interesting study because at, at the way the game is played, he, he plays it a little bit different. He shoots a ton of mid-range jump shots. Mm-hmm. Like, like he is really, really good there. He shot the three better here late in the season, but he's still much more comfortable from about 12 to 17 feet. And so unless they can get some three-point shooting, I worry about them really making a long They need Kousher. Yeah, they need Kousher to make some threes. Kousher or or Caleb Grill, one of those two guys to get going from three to take some pressure off of of, of Brockington uh, to really make a run. TCU, I think, is maybe a team that – is maybe a little bit under the radar. And I, I only say this, they do something that can overcome bad shooting. They rebound the ball at a high level. They're the second best offensive rebounder team in the country. Uh, and then they also have a guy who can, when defenses are good, he can create good shots for himself and for his teammates and Mike Miles. Um, and so then they have two other shot makers and Chuck O'Bannon and Damian Ball, who both have had some really good uh, games this year. Um, but, yeah, I think having Mike Miles and being able to rebound the ball the way they do gives them a chance. And, obviously, Jamie Dix is a great coach. I mean, he, he also is another guy who's been there. He's been – he's made runs in this deal. And so, again, I don't know their path. I haven't studied the bracket per se. Uh, but I, I think they'll be able to win a game or two here this weekend. Uh, hey, what, Texas, what did you think – yeah, what did you think of, of Beard – Mike calling out his players at the end of the year? How much of that do you, do you think was – you know, a motivational ta- tactic here to, to yeah, call them I mean, out. Again, this time of year, uh, the tensions are high, and I'm sure we'll get into it. Like, like there's a lot at stake right now. This is the make or break time of year for, for everybody, for all of us, for the kids, for the coaches, for the administrators, for the fans. Like, this is where you fundraise. You feel the pressure. Yeah, absolutely. Like, you feel everybody, the pressure going. Everybody on. does. There was a big deal made about um, Doug Sermon's ejecting Huggins in like the first five minutes of the game. <laughs> There's pressure on the officials too. They're trying to advance. They want, they want to make the to final four. They want to make, they want to make the final speed. four for this. Yeah. Um, Mike, have you ever been yeah. ejected five minutes into a game? No, 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 no. I've been ejected <laughs> with about five seconds left in the game. <laughs> did, the did, game you, did you earn over. it? Did you earn I did. it? I did. It was, it was actually in Waco. It was actually really? it was the only injection I've had. Yeah. It, you know, my wife still hasn't stopped giving me grief about it, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mike, Mike wanted to get, he wanted to get the hell out of Waco early. <laughs> no, but I, I do, I do think part of it is right. He's got a lot of new faces, guys who haven't been around him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that he's trying to say, Hey man, listen, I've been here and done this. You guys haven't. Buy in. That's and right. When we, yeah. when we said we were going to come together to do this, It was about this time of year. So the next time we lose, it's over. Right. Mm -hmm. We don't get to go back to practice tomorrow. Good call. Yep. 
Well, well, listen, there have been some uh, coaching changes that have happened today. We've had some news break. We had one coach out and one coach. Uh, it sounds like he is going to be in. Uh, we have Jeff Goodman, our stadium insider, is going to be telling us all about it coming up next. We clear? You're clear. All right. Yeah. Chat. We got any questions? Get some questions in. Yes. Uh, we got, we have, we have we a few. Anything? We have a few. Um, how do you feel of the odds of a 5 12 upset of UAB over Houston? I like it. I picked it. I, I've said it all year. Houston isn't the same team the last 15 or so, 20 games. When they had Marcus Sasser, when they had Tremont Mark, they had their best two scores. The, the net. I just think, again, they're ranked so high in these analytics. I think it's a bunch of bullshit. Uh, Kelvin's done an incredible job, incredible job. Any team that loses their their top two offensive players and still wins their league, incredible. I, yeah. I just but, still- hey, uh, One thing I will say is that we did talk to Jelly Walker yesterday. Um, if, yeah. you, uh, if you guys want to go find it on the YouTube channel, that was a really, really powerful interview. He talked about what he went through with his, uh, his older brother um, was murdered when he was 16 years old. Uh, I, I go the other way. I okay. think Houston is tough as 30 shit. Seconds. I think Houston has proven they are. Over, they're proven over the years that they are very much a next man up kind of a program and they just find a way to get it done. And, and I think they're going to find a way to get it done. Now, I like that Chattanooga upset though. 15. Really? The only yeah. thing I say he like, likes Illinois losing. Andy Kennedy gets these little guards and gives them the seconds. most supreme confidence ever. Yeah, he sure does. He sure does. Yes. There you go. No always got to do it like that. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. It is the Field of 68 After Dark. We are live. Sirius XM Channel 84. That is the ESPNU station. We're live over on YouTube. Hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. Help us out. Uh, jump in the chat. Ask us some questions. My name is Rob Doster. I have Oklahoma head state. Uh, Oklahoma coach, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, State head coach. There we go. There we, it's, hey, look, it's been a long week, guys. It's been a long <laughs> week. Oklahoma State head coach Mike Boyton and Stadium Insider Jeff Goodman. We got to talk about some of the coaching changes that we have uh, coming up here and that have happened over the course of the last week. I want to start with Travis Steele, Jeff. Um, he found out today after winning a game in the NIT with his season still alive, that he is not going to be returning uh, as the head coach at Xavier. My understanding is that this was something of a surprise. Uh, what can you tell me about Travis Steele and the Xavier job? It, it was. I mean, anytime you're fired when you're still alive in the NIT or NCAA tournament, it's obviously going to be a surprise. Uh, athletic director Greg Christopher made the move. Uh, they had a couple meetings today. It was trending in that direction, and, and he pulled the plug on Travis Steele after – you know, four years and no NCAA tournaments. I get it. Listen, if you want to do it, do it. But don't do it during the NCAA NIT tournament. Do it either before it starts or wait till it's over. You got to wonder, honestly, if at this point, Greg Christopher felt like, hey, I almost, I don't want to wait much longer. I got some guys in mind. I'm going to make the move. But he should have done it before the NIT ever started. Now, there was a kid on the in, in the game last night. Uh, ben Stanley, who doesn't play a whole heck of a lot from Hampton, transferred him from Hampton, that, that kind of caused a little bit of a, of a stir on the bench last night. But I don't think that had anything to do with it. Again, I don't get it if I'm Greg Christopher, but uh, what I will say is what I do get, go after Sean Miller. Go after the field. I don't want to lose Sean Miller from the field of 68. He's been awesome this year. But I, I know he likes coaching more than he likes being, you know, talking to Rob Doster. So <laughs> I, I, I'd like to see Sean get on his feet again. And I think going back to Xavier is a no brainer if I'm Greg Christopher. I'll tell you this. If we put him on every night with John Fanta, we might be able to keep him. It's a good point. It's <laughs> a good point. Uh, I, I, I just. The timing sucks. and Doing it in the like while the season is still going on, I think is wrong. It's unfair to the kids that are going to have to deal with this. Like they still have to go play games and then their coach just got fired after a win. That's, that's not the right way to do things, but I, I don't necessarily think that this should have been all that much of a surprise. Like this is the third straight year. They've had a really bad end of the season. They have not made it back to the tournament since Travis Steele was the head coach. Uh, this was supposed to be the year where they found a way to get it done. You got Paul Scruggs back for a surprise year, brought in Jack Nungy, you got Zach Freeman. So they kind of built this team. So um I like Travis. I don't like seeing uh, guys lose their jobs, but I was not necessarily surprised to see. Well, it, at Xavier, listen, 
you can't go zero for four, Xavier. No. As much as we all love Travis, and you don't want anybody to lose their job, Xavier is just a job that has been so successful, no matter who's come through there, right? Whether it's Thad Mata, Sean Miller, Chris Mack, they've had so much success. So the expectations right now are Xavier that you go to the tournament every single year, and that's probably unfair, but you probably need to go more than uh, well, you need to go once in, in four years at the very least. Yeah. So uh, the other news that came out today, Magic Johnson broke the news. Magic Johnson yeah. scooped Jeff Goodman. He said, congratulations yeah. to my friend Kenny Payne on getting yeah. the job as the head coach of the Louisville Cardinals. Jeff, can you confirm uh, college basketball <laughs> insider Magic Johnson's report that Kenny Payne is going to be the next head coach of the Louisville Cardinals? Uh, Irvin, Irvin, what are you doing? Stay in your lane, Irvin. I mean, come on. You're going to be a news break? I got to compete with, with Magic? I'm not winning that battle. Let's, no, let's face not. it. But uh, listen, this was something that I felt like was going to happen all along. Like this job opened, and immediately I'm looking at it objectively and saying, all right, they don't have a, a, an AD. They have an interim AD. They don't have a president. They've still got NCAA violations kind of hanging over their head in investigation. They're waiting for their penalties. They could get another year postseason ban. No sitting head coach in their right mind who loves their job and has a good high major job is going to go to that type of situation. Um, they tried. They tried Scott Drew. They tried Mick Cronin. They tried other guys. And all of them respectfully declined because, again, you're, you're you know, if you're in a good spot and you – and Mike can talk to this. I don't want you to talk about jobs, Mike, but I want you to talk about how important it is to know your administration and be happy working for that administration. Yeah, I, I think it's the most important part of this entire you know, equation is just the alignment that you can have up and down, right? Yeah. Right. Your staff, your assistants, your GAs, your players, right? But then also, right? Who's the basketball, not just who's the AD, right? Because that's important, but who's, who's in charge of the sport? Who's yeah. the sport administrator yeah. for you? Who, who are you going to when somebody needs to update the graphics? Because that's probably not your AD, right? Who do you, who needs to, who need to make sure you're getting your private plane to go for, to Augusta, to Atlanta in July? Like those, that, those relationships, that communication, which kind of begs the question, you know, who's he, who hired, who's making a hire right now? And, and I'm, I'm obviously, yeah. you know, if it's, if it's true and come, I'm happy for Kenny. I've known him for a long time. He's been great to me. Uh, obviously well-respected in our industry has been a dynamic um, person in the business for a long time, recruited a lot of high level dudes for, for Cal. Uh, and a and great Cal, guy, and, Mike. And at Oregon, Mike, no doubt. No doubt. Just a good low key, no ego person. Period. And I'll say this, we didn't really ever, our, other than Tyrese Maxey, we didn't really go head-to-head -head recruiting against them much. We That's just not, those aren't the type of guys we've recruited a lot. Uh, but I, I know a lot of kids who went there while he was there, and those kids talk about his in, in, input and, yeah. and relationship that they had with him as much as anything as to being why it's, it was such a great place to be while he was there. And so... I got no doubt he'll be able to continue that as a head coach. He'll get, he'll get a great staff. And, you know, obviously it's a high, high level job and um, nobody knows it as well as he does, though. He'll do a good job at it. The, the one thing that I do think is good about this, um, and we have seen this over the course of the last couple cycles, that there have been more minority assistant coaches getting their first head coaching job at bigger jobs. And that's something that you have obviously had experience with. And I think it's it's I'm, I'm glad to see it. Right. Because I, I wrote a story about this, and we've talked about this before, Mike. But it's it's not the easiest thing in the world to be able to get those opportunities, and and um, even if it's a situation where uh, it came at, at the result of having sanctions potentially hanging over the head of the program or not knowing who you're going to root uh, uh, work for, I, I do think that Kenny getting this chance is is a good thing overall, and I hope he does well. Yeah, he will, and, and there's no doubt. I mean, I'm a living example here of a guy who was. You know, and, and I'll be honest, I, I wouldn't be surprised if either one of you were critical to hire. I never, been, Mike, I, mean, I, I, I would never, <laughs> never be critical of any hire. Come on. But the, you know, but the truth is for a Big 12 program, this I was a risk. I just happened to be at a place where the AD was comfortable taking that risk on and, and having enough courage to say, 
I'm going to help try to make sure we provide the resources to give this guy a chance to be successful. And then it's on me to, to do the job well or, or not. And, and if I didn't, then obviously, you know, I wouldn't be here in year, you know, just having finished year five. So uh, I'm thankful to the AD I had. I'm thankful to the AD that I have now because they really believed in me and gave me an opportunity. But there's a lot of qualified black coaches out there who just, for whatever reason, uh, and maybe some of them haven't really pursued opportunities uh, to the level that they want. But I know that they're guys, and I'm going to name a few that I know that are, are qualified. If, if you don't mind, if I can give some plugs. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, do it. Uh, but Colin Hartman, who's a dear friend of mine, mm -hmm. awesome. assistant coach yep. at UNLV, uh, Alvin Brooks, the uh, third, and, mm -hmm. and Jerome Tang's great. His name's out there already. There's a lot of people stepping for him, but Alvin Brooks, the third <laughs> Taylor is every bit ready to be a head coach. Um, he grew up around this game. His dad's the head coach at Lamar now uh, from Houston, done a great job recruiting in the state of Texas, but also in Florida. I think he re recruited Keontae, John uh, Keontae um, George. Yep. Kendall Brown, like those guys have done a great job. Sadie Washington, who's at Michigan, there's a reason he was kept on, right? He's still finding a way to have success. Uh, Kamani was was in the spotlight a couple of weeks ago. I think he's another guy, Kamani Young at UConn. Uh, Chen Coleman. Let's, let's yeah. keep Kamani there for a, 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 let's get through the last, next three weeks with Kamani at UConn, all right? We need, we need, we need UConn making a run here. I'm a UConn <laughs> fan. Like, let's, let's keep Kamani there for at least three more weeks, all right? Can we do that? Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. I think I think that's fine. But but his opportunity is going to be there and he's going to be ready. You know, he mm -hmm. obviously showed um, he could do a little bit of everything. He, he took over a game in the middle of a game now yeah. where there was a mm -hmm. lot going on and he didn't flinch and his guys responded because they trust him. Um, but, you know, another one is Chen Coleman, who's at uh, Kentucky now, was at Illinois with Brad for a couple of years, spent some time at um uh, I think Illinois, Chicago, maybe UIC. Yes, um, that's and, right. And then, uh, you know, Mike Jones at Virginia Tech, who's been a head coach at the high school level, mm -hmm. been around elite players for a long time. He's at Virginia Tech with a really good friend of mine, Mike Young. So there's a lot. I mean, I just named five or six, but there are a lot of guys who are prepared and, and I think would do well if ADs would just, you know, allow them to come sit down and talk to them. Yep. Yep. Um, Mike, we got a, we got about a minute here, but give me the, the yeah. one piece of advice that you would give to any assistant that is getting their first big time head coaching gig. Hire great staff. Um, <laughs> hire great staff. So and, simple. And I, I say this, well, yes, it sounds so simple. Right. Um, recruiting is obviously the most important thing you do. You got to have great players, but if you don't have a great staff, it makes that part even harder. So Take your time, get the best staff that you're capable of having, and then go to war with them every day. Well, listen, my, we uh, – My biggest question before we go, Rob, and, and we're at the end of this game, Rutgers with the ball, 69-69. Ron Harper Jr., right? I mean – I think it's Baker. Baker's got the ball, right? No, I'm saying we got – we're going to Ron Harper here, right? No, he didn't get it. Oh, he didn't get missed it. it. And missed they it. missed it. They should have went to Ron Harper Jr., and they didn't they get it to they him. They should have. So we're going Gio to overtime. Baker. Yeah, we're we're heading to overtime. Um, but before we do that, we got to take a quick break here. Uh, when we come back, we're going to be talking a little bit about the East region because I do believe that that is going to be the region of chaos, and I'm going to prove to Jeff Goodman why I'm right. Can't wait. And you're clear. All right, Dagan. Let's uh, let's open this up to the chat. We got any questions? Yes, we do. Out of all the tournament teams, which one player? Do you want with the ball in his hands with 10 seconds to go, one possession game? Ooh, good me. That's a great question. I would say here, here's my issue. Like Johnny Davis, I might have said, but he's hurt. So I'm not going to say Johnny Davis. Jaden Ivey, I think, just because I think he's got that gear. I know, I know his, his questionable like decision making at times. Who no, am I, I forgetting, I'm, Rob? I, I, I like Jaden. Who I like am I Jayden? forgetting? There's Ooh. one very obvious answer here. Colin Gillespie. Yeah, that's a good call. That's a good call. He's like Colin Gillespie. And he's yeah. just like, he, he will never, ever, ever get rattled by the moment. Never. It's amazing. This dude is absolutely unflappable. I'm, yeah, I just think Jaden, the one thing with Jaden is he can turn the corner and just get there and finish through contact. contact. He, he's just so electric. The one other guy that I would say is Johnny Juzang. 
He's no. been there. He's done it before. He's he literally had the ball in his hands with 10 seconds left and carried yep, UCLA from the first four to the final four. He's already yep. done it. So why wouldn't you want to do it again? Am I crazy here, Mike? Talk I'm some going sense with Jack, you. guys. I was around that dude Jack? with USA 19 under Jack? basketball. I'm, I'm going with Jack. 15. Wow. <laughs> Look at that. That is surprising. I know he's a freshman, but sometimes you just see guys that are a little bit different. Five. There you go. Welcome back. It is the Field of 68 After Dark. We are live. Sirius XM Channel 84. That is the ESPNU station. We're streaming live over on YouTube. If you're watching there, hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. Jump in the chat. Ask us some questions. We answer them during our breaks. Rob Doster with Stadium Insider Jeff Goodman and uh, Oklahoma State head coach Mike Boyd. And I got it right that time. I only needed one attempt to do it. Uh, we're watching the end of this Rutgers-Notre Dame game here. We have gone to overtime at a very nice 69-69. to 69. Uh, Jeff, we'll talk about the West region in a little bit because I think that this matchup might uh, bust up the West. The, whoever wins this might bust up the, the West region. So I want to ask you about the East. I think that the East region is going to be the bracket of chaos. There's always one region in the NCAA tournament that goes completely insane. And I think this year it is going to be the East region. Tell me why I'm wrong. Well, I, I think number one, because I think Kentucky is the best team in the East region and they're going to run through it. Um, you know, I, I love Purdue, but I just think Purdue defensively, I don't trust them. Kentucky, again, they've got the one thing that nobody else has in, in that region, which is, I mean, I guess you could say Baylor kind of has two point guards. I still think Flagler is much more of a two than a one. Uh, where Kentucky has two legitimate point guards that complement each other so well in Severe Wheeler and Todd Ty Washington. So I, I just – I don't see anybody coming out of there but Kentucky. Now, I, again, maybe I'll be wrong. I, I just think they're that much better. But, but like, yes, I could see Carolina beating Baylor. You know, I could see Indiana beating UCLA. I could see Virginia I, I, Tech beating Purdue. I think that uh, Marquette can beat Baylor as well. You, you know, we talked, Mike talked yeah, about it earlier. Team, teams with length and athleticism can give them trouble. Yeah. And that's what, uh, that's what Marquette has. I think Kentucky has the easiest path to the final four of any of the top two seats. I don't think that they play Purdue. I think that Virginia tech picks them off uh, your boy, Mike young there, Mike. He can most, get it underrated, done. most underrated coach in America. Yeah. Most underrated Why? storyteller Why? in America. Why, Mike. Why is he the most underrated? Well, you know, he, he was he was having a success at Wofford for about eight years before anybody even realized it. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I mean, and I'll it was the honest, worst job in the league then. You know, it was probably not good, but yeah. I, I thought for sure because they both had multiple openings during Mike's time at Wofford. But I thought Wake Forest and, and Vanderbilt would each have, have tried because of the academic background at the school right. he was at and the academic background at those places. I thought they would each have tried. Uh, and Virginia Tech missed the boat on him a couple of times. He's from, yeah, he's from that area. You know, they hired a couple of guys before they figured it out as well. But uh, he's so good with kids. Uh, he gets them to believe. He runs great stuff offensively, but he's really good defensively as well. And he doesn't get, he doesn't get over, uh, overwhelmed with um, high-level talent. He believes that if he can get the right guys – he can coach them in a way. Not he doesn't. He he wants great players. Don't get me wrong, right? But Hunter Couture, he he saw and thought he was really good. He signed Hunter Couture at Wofford. He had Kevin Lume at Wofford. He had Storm Murphy at Wofford. Those three That's dudes crazy. just went and kicked. They went and kicked Duke's butt for an ACC championship, oh man. God. That's unbelievable. You think about that. The three three mm -hmm. Wofford signees beat Duke for ACC championship. Hey, and I, a freshman, I, Darius Maddox. I want to ask you a question, Mike. I don't know if you know this stat. Uh, since 2010, there's only been one team that did that won the national title that didn't have basically two point guards uh, starting. And that was Kentucky when they had Anthony Davis and Michael Kidd Gilchrist with a first round pick at the point in Marquis T. Um, yeah. Why? What, what's the value of having those two guards? What's the value of having like Jared Butler and Davion Mitchell or Kihei Clark and, uh, and Ty Jerome? Or Ryan Archie Diacono and Jalen Brunt. Like, why, why does why does that help college basketball teams make runs in March? Well, really, at all levels, to be honest. I mean, think about the game, right? Coaches trust most the guys who they have that have the ball in their hands. Those usually are guys who understand what the coach wants 
on both ends of the court. Those are the guys that communicate the best with their teammates. Those are the guys who have a great feel for um, Kellen Grady's made two straight threes. We need to run this stagger pin down or whatever it is to get him a shot. Or he's looking for him in transition. When you get guys who don't always play point, trying to play point, they don't think that way. They think about trying to get themselves going a lot more often. And sometimes a guy may hit a couple, and it's not that they're selfish. It's just that their mindset isn't, man, this dude's got it going. We need to keep feeding him. Um, you know, and so when you got Anthony Davis and Mike Kidd Gilchrist, you can overcome not having a great point guard. <laughs> when you got a Hall of Fame coach and Ocha Baji, some people criticize Kansas on whether they have a great point guard this year. Dewan Harris is good enough when you got an All American and a Hall of Fame coach to go with him. And so that's mm -hmm. why I think they can win it. But but having those guys that really understand the game can execute late game situations, especially in the tournament setting that you don't, cause you don't have time to teach everything. You don't have time to prep for everything and short turnarounds from Friday to Sunday or Thursday to Saturday this time of year. So you need your guys to be as connected as ever. And your point guard's got to lead that, that part of the game. Yep. Goodman. Here's the list of teams that I have that are top three seeds that fit that two, uh, two kind of lead okay. guard model. Gonzaga. Yep. Gonzaga, Baylor, yep. Kentucky, uh, Tennessee, Villanova, and Auburn. To me, those Villanova, are Villanova. Villanova has two point guards. I mean, they have Colin Gillespie and Justin Moore, and they the way that they run their offense is very much yeah, it's very much same thing as 2018 team. They basically had four guys that were that you could classify as lead guards on the floor there as decision makers. So I put them in the we mix. Put Illinois in, in there. There are four seeds, so but they would okay. they would definitely okay. be in that conversation if we want to open it up and add them yeah. in there as well. No, I, I don't know what how far you would go now. Is that that's your guy? Cabello. That's that's Brad, right? That's your guy. Yeah, Cabello, Cabello's a, you know, he's dynamic, man. And then Trent Frazier, he's been through it. You know, I, this is fifth year. He's tough as nails. When Cabello was out, Trent Frazier really was leading them. They can, you know, the thing about Illinois this year, as opposed to the last few years, they can really everybody except Kofi can shoot threes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everybody. Oh, they're dangerous. Team. I got them going the final four. I got them going the final four this year. I know Curbelo's the key still, because even coming off the bench, sometimes he just knows one speed and, and he gets himself into trouble. If he, you know, to me, it's, it's Curbelo and Kirk Risa are two guys that are so important to their teams. And especially in the NCAA tournament, you can't have those up and down games like that as a yeah. point guard. You sure. can't, you can't, you can rebound from them. The, and even in a loss in the regular season, no big deal. It's one game. Well, right. if you have one of those games where Curbelo has seven turnovers or Kirk Creasy goes one for 11, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. You watched it last night, right? You had 10 turnovers and starting point guard for Wyoming. Yeah, that's right. Maldonado. Yeah. Maldonado triple double with, uh, with turnovers. Not, not, <laughs> not what you want, but uh, we call, he, we call that a, we call that a trouble double. Trouble double. <laughs> kind of was last night. All right, Goodman. So who do you have coming out of the East? You have Kentucky? I do. I have Kentucky coming out of the East. You know, I, I kind of said all year, like to me, Gonzaga, not all year, because I gave, I don't want to say I gave up on Kentucky, but early on they hadn't done anything to warrant uh, feeling good about Kentucky. But preseason, I loved them. Gonzaga, you know, the only thing that worries me, and I forget who said this. Somebody said it, I think, on the show the other night. Might have been pro. I don't remember who it was, but they said the 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 backups, the reserves for Gonzaga are so young and they haven't played. Like I like Nolan Hickman a lot, but he hasn't gotten a ton of run. I thought he'd get m way more run in the WCC than Mark Few gave him this year. So I don't know if he's as far along as I thought he'd be to be able to play with them hard. Um, so that they, they don't they don't really have the two point guard you know, on the floor that much together. I, I, was, I was saying Nemhard and Rasir Bolton. He's not really a point. He's not really yeah, a point. Yeah, but he kind of – he played with the ball in his hands last year at uh, – at, He's at, not a good decision. Iowa State. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, you tell – Mike knows better than, than me or you. Is Rashir, I, Rashir, I, didn't, Rashir, I, would, I wouldn't put him as a point, but as a secondary ball handler, he's good enough. Mm -hmm. And especially because he can create his own shot. Yeah, so he checks the box, Goodman. Goodman. There you go. Yeah. I'm, and I'm, that's fair. He, 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 is, he is checking the box. But but I'm most of those guys that you mentioned, most of the guys you mentioned over the last 10 years or so were like more point 
than than two. I think Bolton's more two than point. Fair One enough. of the great things about Kentucky, I don't know if you guys know the numbers. I think both Sabir, who's taken an incredible amount of pressure off Ty Ty this year, yes. being a freshman mm-hmm. with the expectations, yeah. right? But That's they're right. both they're both like four and a half assists to one turnover a game. It's incredible their numbers. I love Ty Ty. I love. I think Ty Ty. I mean, again, I think you're gonna see Ty Ty at the next level be like one of those guys where you look back and you're like, he only averaged that in college. I, I think he can be Jamal Murray, that type but of player. I'm telling you, Sabir Will has really, really done a great yep. job of really yes. just – because he's their point guard now. now. So there's the one. I mean, and, and he's put up these numbers. I mean, he's small, but he's got a toughness about him. Uh, he'll guard you. Uh, I think maybe the un, maybe underappreciated guy in Kentucky is Keon Brooks. He's been great lately. Great over the last, you know, 15 yeah. games or so. And yeah, no, no doubt. All right. What do we got? We got Notre Dame up to uh, yeah. 50 we, seconds uh, left. Oh, Ron Ron Hunter banks it in. Perfect. He, he called bank right when we need to go take a break. So when we come back, we're going to talk about the end of this uh, Rutgers Notre Dame game. And we are also I'm going to lock Jeff Goodman in on his final four picks. So make sure you listen so you know what not to have in your bracket. You're clear. All right. All right. Do we, do I have we, a question. We, I got a question for Mike. We could save this for the afters if you want, Dagan, but we need his his favorite Kate Cunningham story. Do we want that for the afters? Let's we gotta save yeah, it for the afters. It. We save gotta it. save that All for right. the afters. All right. I know you I know you got some that good. Give some Mike. time. The uh, one you've never yeah. told. Mike, you, you've got 15 minutes to think about the Cade story you've never told before. <laughs> All right. All right. What do we got, All Mike? Dagan? Hold on, I, I do have a question, Mike. You're from you're from Brooklyn, right? Yeah. So yeah. you saw you saw the shot that Ron Hunter just banked in. Yeah. If it's ten nine and you're playing at the park and you bank in that three, right That's for game, good. doesn't good. count, right? No way. Does it count now? <laughs> Hell yeah. Yeah, it counts <laughs> now. But if you don't call bank, man, that shit don't count. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dagan, what do we got? We got any questions? And find um, one from earlier. Is Baylor being written off too soon? 30 seconds. I never like betting against Scott Drew. I just, they got six guys right now. They got six guys. It's just, it's hard for me to buy into a team that has literally no bench. If they were healthy, if you could tell me that right now they had a healthy LJ Cryer and a healthy Jonathan Chambachacho, then I might pick them to win the national title. Am I crazy? 10 seconds. No, not at all. Five. There you go. It is the field of 68 after dark. We have about 15 minutes left here on Sirius XM channel 84. That is the ESPN station. If you're listening, we're going to jump over to YouTube for the afters. Uh, coming up next, if you're watching on YouTube, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. My name is Rob Doster. I have stadium insider Jeff Goodman with me and Oklahoma State head coach Mike Boyton. We are watching the end of this Rutgers Notre Dame thriller in the first four. Rutgers is up 76 to 75. There are 28 seconds left. Rutgers have the has the ball. Uh, Jeff, we teased it a little bit. You said that you have Kentucky coming out of the East. I need you to lock in your final four picks right now. You can't flip flop anymore. Right. You can't waffle. Right. You can't do anything. Right. Yeah, we got to steal. We got to steal. Turnover. What? Are you guys? Are you guys behind me? No, I just missed that. I was. I was looking at my bracket. What just Rutgers, Rutgers? Rutgers turned the ball over in the backcourt. Notre Dame got a steal. Dame Goodwin got a layup to take a 77-76 lead. Nineteen seconds left. Timeout. Rutgers. While there's a timeout, Jeff, right. lock in right. your picks. These are official. You cannot change these again. <sighs> You like to waffle. You like to go back and forth. You, right. These are official. All right, hold on. I, I, yeah, I get. I need something though as I as I do this. Um, all right, give me, Kinsa- give me, give me your elite eight. So tell me who you have beaten who to get to the final four. Is this some St. Uh, Pat's Notre Dame stuff again? Is this some St. Patrick's Day? Notre Dame? <laughs> <laughs> it might be. It might be. You know, we, when um, I was with Stephen F, I'll give you a couple more seconds to think, Jeff. Thanks, when I, was I with appreciate. Steve F. Austin, it. We, we beat West Virginia in Brooklyn. Brad's last year there and played Notre Dame on a Sunday, St. Patrick's Day Sunday, and lost to him on a tip in by some kid named Flugler like three seconds ago. Rex Flugler. 
Rex um, Fluger, yeah. All right, all he, right. He had, he had great hair. That that was one of those kids who was like, he "How did. are you? Gonna lose? We're gonna lose to a kid with that haircut? Come on now, right?" All right he looked like he should go. have been a TikTok superstar. <laughs> Good. Are you gonna give us picks? What are we doing over here? All right, here we go. I'm watching the end of the game here. All right, here we go. Oh, oh okay. Rutgers. With the three. So we got eight seconds left. This game's been up. really good. This game's it's been, been really game. fun. Yeah, fun to watch. I mean, who would have thought a Rutgers game would might, you know, get to 80 here? <laughs> here we go. And, oh, what a finish. Oh, gonna, my goodness. We're going to go out in another overtime. Ron, we're going to. Ron Harper, another Ron one Harper half Jr. court again. Oh, he almost said it. All right. We have another Double overtime OT, coming baby. up. Double OT. This game wouldn't be over. Unbelievable. Yeah, that, that's what it is, man. That's what it is. We get Mike Boynton on here. We have games that go all night long. All right, Jeff, uh, all right. lock them in. You got to lock right. them in now. The people are it. waiting. The people are wanting your picks. All right. I got Gonzaga uh, beating Duke in the, in, in, the, in the West. No surprise there. I know people are like, well, Duke's not defending this, that, the other. You know what? Here's, here's my, my tiebreaker on this. Coach K is going out. He's going to get a few calls. He's going to get a few calls down the stretch here. So they're going to make sure he's in the elite eight. I know, Mark. I can say that. You can't say that. I can say that. I got no problem saying. Uh, all right. In the East, I have uh, Kentucky beating. Um, I'm going to go with. Uh, you think I haven't looked at the brackets yet? I'm going to go with North Carolina. Carolina, Kentucky beating North Carolina in the Elite Eight. I think Carolina's got their mojo back a little bit. Um, we'll see. Anyway, uh, I have uh, Illinois uh, and Arizona in the Elite Eight in, uh, in the South, and I have Kansas and uh, Auburn in the, in the Midwest. To the Final Four, I have Gonzaga playing Kentucky, and I have Kansas um, playing – and this is this is an honor of my boy Kirk Creesa. All right. But they're they're gonna play Illinois. Illinois is gonna knock off Arizona. Wow. Illinois is gonna knock off Arizona. Kirk Creesa is never gonna talk to me again. But I'm sorry, Kerr. I saw your ankle. It Are looks you like be shit. Back in Tucson? I know, I know. It's it's bad. It's bad. He already Dirt has back. to go there under a fake name. So it's not like this not is anymore. Be worse. That was good. That was that was about 10 years ago. Uh, and then I got Kansas. Uh, beating Auburn. So Kansas plays Illinois. Gonzaga plays Kentucky. Kentucky ends up um, losing to Gonzaga. I got Gonzaga in Kansas in the title game. And I have Mark Few beating Bill Self for his first ever national title. So people could shut the hell up about Gonzaga not winning a national title and how like, it's the stupidest thing ever, Mike. That people, people rip on Mark Few for not winning a national title. They have no idea what Mark Few has built out there and how ridiculous it is. Like, I'm, I'm so tired of hearing that. Yeah, people need to stop ripping on, on Mark Few for that. They also need to stop ripping on you. Look, you got confused. You said that Illinois-Arizona was an Elite Eight game. It's going to be a Sweet 16 game. We know oh, you sorry. haven't looked at the bracket. We know you don't really know what you're talking about. So I'm sorry. We, I got, we, I got, we right, forgive I got you. Illinois. I got Illinois beating Villanova. I'm sorry. Illinois yeah, beating right. Villanova. So here's here's my picks. I have I'm with you on Kentucky coming out of the East. I have them beating UCLA. I have UCLA uh, getting through the Sweet 16 um, to get to uh, beating. I, I have them beating North Carolina as well. So I have Kentucky beating UCLA in one region. I have uh, Gonzaga beating Texas Tech in the West. I think Texas Tech, their length, their athleticism is just going to overwhelm Duke. And I think the moment is going to be too big for the, those those kids at Duke. The, the one thing from watching them in some of the, the biggest situations, like it feels like the whole Coach K's final season. Don't want to be the last team to lose at home for Coach K. It, yeah. it feels like that might be a little well, bit too much. Didn't, didn't go well handle. for his last home game. So you, you're probably right. I mean, you're, it did not. you're probably right. Again, I'm just I'm just looking at the uh, the men in stripes to save yeah. Coach K here. If yeah, Tech and, and Gonzaga and, play, they played already. Mm -hmm. and Gonzaga won pretty handily. Yeah, yeah. Watch yeah. out for those games where a team beat somebody pretty easily early in the year, because usually the team that lost makes the most adjustments. Yeah, because you change what you're doing. If you beat them, right. why would you change what you're doing? Exactly. You don't need yeah. to. Probably. Um, I have Villanova. 
in the uh, in the South, I have Villanova beating Arizona. I have Villanova getting past Tennessee, getting past Arizona, and getting to the Final Four, where they will play Auburn, who I have knocking off uh, knocking off Kansas. Then I have Villanova and Kentucky getting to the national title game and all Wildcats title game. And I have Kentucky cutting down the nets. Uh, John Calipari is going to win the national title mm-hmm. in Coach K's last season. They, oh. the, the, the bracketing gods did not give us the opportunity yeah. to have Coach Cal and Coach K playing in the national title game, which is what I wanted. And I think Kirk Kreese's uh, ankle is going to make sure that we don't get a Gonzaga, Arizona national yeah. title game, which is probably the second best option. So I'm going with the Kentucky, Kentucky getting there and finding a way to they get needed to put Cal. Hey, they needed to put Kentucky against uh, Memphis. They, they missed out on an opportunity to do that. I don't even know if they could have with the, the yeah, the they, they could have. They could have done it. Pick Nova in the national championship game. You may be the They're going to get there. I'm telling you, just watch. Colin Gillespie is an absolute machine. I'm pretty sure, uh, it, you know, they're, they're, people talk about their the ancestral DNA when you do all those studies and everything. Uh, when his came back, he was 75% robot. So I think that he's going to have a chance to get into the <laughs> national title game. He doesn't get affected by moments. Uh, Mike, you got to give us a national champ, man. We got about two and a half minutes left here. I'm, I'm forcing you to pick That's a right. national champion. You have no choice. Wow. And so, you know, Obviously, have not looked at the bracket, um, but I've talked about them earlier. I'm going to take Kansas Jayhawks to win it all. I don't know <laughs> Big how. Big Twelve, how baby. Uh, but I think, like I said, they got they got a first team All American, high level shot maker. They guard you. Uh, they can throw it inside, you know, well enough. Uh, and they got a Hall of Fame out there over there who's he's not going to be guessing when he gets there. So. No. Yeah, actually, one of Mike, one of your assistants just texted me your uh, your full bracket. Um, it's the, he has <laughs> he has Kansas, Baylor, Texas Tech, and TCU in the final four. <laughs> probably true. Probably true. All right, uh, Goodman. Let, we got about a minute left here. Yeah. Uh, who who is the other than Baylor? Who is one of the top two seeds that you think is the most likely to lose early in the tournament? Who's the most likely to be upset? I think Auburn. I think Auburn. I mean, again, their point guard play has not been great. They haven't made shots lately. Now they're stranded in Auburn. They can't get to Greenville. I mean, to me, just get in the car, right? Like, get in the car. And what is it, Mike? You know, four and a half hours? They're stranded in Auburn? They had some, like, Uh, water. So they got to get this. Greenville's two hours from Atlanta. Yeah, it's about four and a half hours. Yeah, get in the damn car. Grind it like the rest of us. Come on. They were from flying? (laughs) They were flying. Yeah, they were taking a plane there. Instead, wow. they're going to take three. They're trying to get – I talked to Bruce a couple hours ago. They were trying to get three little private planes and then bus all the gear in, I assume. Yeah. I don't, Bruce, I don't know. Bruce Pearl left Southern Indiana, and all of a sudden he is too good to hop on a bus and drive from Auburn to Greenville. Unbelievable, this guy. Unbelievable. I got, I got, I got a sneaky suspicion they have some people with some planes that can fly whatever the <laughs> think, <laughs> think? <laughs> You think? <laughs> It's over, man. Figure it out. Get it done. Uh, no excuses. Play like a champion. Uh, speaking of playing like a champion, we had Mike Boyton, Oklahoma State head coach, join us tonight. It was nice to finally have a little bit of sanity on the show. I'm used to dealing with Jeff Goodman, our stadium insider. Uh, but listen, tomorrow it's the holiday. It's the NCAA tournament. It is finally here Thursday, 1215. Make sure you check us out. We'll be live at the River Sportsbook Studio tomorrow in Philadelphia. So until then, Rob Dosser, this is the Field of 68 After Dark. Clear. Beautiful. All right, uh, Mike, we are still live right now. Just so you know, this is uh, the afters. I'm gonna um, warn you. Yeah, we have. We're gonna have uh, people asking us questions, um, jumping in the chat, uh, bringing some stuff up. I just want to make sure everybody here, if you're listening right now, you need to go over and you need to sign up for our uh, for our bracket fanatics yeah. um, group. Uh, We have it going. The link is in the description below. Um, I mentioned it earlier, but we are running a field of 68 pool over at bracketfanatics.com. It's the best website to host an NCAA tournament pool for you and your friends providing a bracket experience unlike any other. Bracket Fanatics is similar to Yahoo and ESPN. You can invite friends, make picks. You can watch those picks go up in flames. But what makes Bracket Fanatics different is that they eliminate the hardest part of running a pool, which is the payouts. Everyone that joins your pool must pay an entry on the site so you don't have to worry about chasing down someone like Jeff Goodman who likes to try to duck out of his buy-ins whether it's fantasy football brackets whatever it is that's what Jeff does you can make side bets all tournament long um, and if your bracket is busted you can make it all back uh, by getting uh, 
uh, into the side bet action. So head on over to bracketfanatics.com. Join the Field of 68 bracket group. The code is field. The link is in the description below. It's free to enter. We have $500 in prizes. And if you enter, here's the most important part. Jeff, I don't even think you know about this. We are giving away five $50 Top Golf gift cards tomorrow on our stream. And we have two tickets to an all you can eat and all you can drink suite at Ooh. the Wells Fargo Center. Uh, in Philadelphia for the Sweet 16 games. That'll be pretty awesome. So go to bracketfanatics.com, use the code field, sign up today. Dagan, it is officially the afters. Give me some questions. I'm going to go back to Jeff's question that he asked earlier. Yeah. And Coach Point, we're going to need a, a, Cade, a Cade story that we've, that we've never heard before. The, the Cade story. Yeah. Like, I want the Cades. I don't want just any other Cade story. Because I know Cade's got some shit to him. I got to, I got a chance to really know Cade sure. pretty well through his brother, who, who's one of the best dudes out there. Um, I love Cade. First time I saw him, Mike, in AU ball, I fell in love with him because he is just all about the right things. But give me something about him that, again, we just don't know. So, so I'll tell you guys. So he, he is really like a, a silent assassin, and, and he wants to kill you in any competition. But he's a really good kid. Yeah. But but he he has he has a combination of supreme confidence and humility that very few people have, right? He doesn't come across as arrogant, but he'll cut your nuts off, right? So so <laughs> so he commits to us, um, and at the end of his kind of recruiting cycle in that fall, that th- it kind of got a little tense. Cal was going at him. It became yep. everybody thought. You know, damn, Mike's gonna look really bad. Hired his brother, and now he's gonna go to Kentucky anyway. <laughs> yes. So I go to Cade. I think the Sunday that he's going to commit, and I don't know this. It's he's literally. I think he just finished his last visit. Was at Washington, and I get there on Sunday. Probably I land in Orlando probably about nine o'clock, and I drive over to Montverde, and it's just me and Cade. And he's like, Coach, I'm coming in. I'm 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 coming. You know, I just got to get this video and, and get an edit and all the stuff that, that 18 year old kids got to do. So he calls me on Monday night. So the Monday night is, I think, November 4th, the day before the season is going to start. And Kade had kind of gotten to a point where he was pissed at Cal by the way he was recruiting him. You know, kind of like strong on him and tell him, like, you, you won't be good enough. You don't believe you, you know, you go, you come to Kentucky if you're the best player in the country. That's that's how this stuff goes. Yep. And so, you know, nobody may remember this, but it was not a coincidence that he made his announcement on the Tuesday of the Champions Classic while Kentucky was playing. I remember <laughs> that. I remember <laughs> that. It was nuts. It was nuts. And everybody in the Kentucky space, like, lost their minds. <laughs> yeah, they did. Yeah, they did. But I, it was I, totally I, planned. Entirely. Uh, Wow. Not a coincidence. All right. So Ron Harper just hit about a, a 30 footer. Blake Wesley to the rim. Ooh. Oh, oh, my goodness. The luck of the Irish. Wow. On St. Patty's. No, Day. Notre Dame is advancing. Guaranteed that they Brad. upset. Guaranteed that they upset. Uh, guaranteed that they upset Alabama. Wow. Unbelievable. What a game. Poor what Michael. a game. Can we? What a, what a game that was. What a shot from Ron Harper. You know, we, we talked about Atkinson. the Ivy yeah. League transfer. Paul the Atkinson. Ivy League, the Ivy League transfer. Um, we talked about guys that you want with the ball in their hands at the end of a game with the game on the line. Ron Harper Jr. has to be up there on any list that we make. Well, like he, he was had, up he, there. Man, I was kind of behind you guys is, when you were watching earlier. Yeah. I just assumed that he was getting the last shot in regulation. Yeah, he should have. He should have. What um, a game. Man, you guys didn't see it. Look at this shot. Look at that. Look, look where he hit that from. Who makes that shot? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And everybody knows, you know, Blake Wesley's right there, right? Right there. Yeah. Serious Wesley question. drives. You guys follow the stuff, and, and you see more coverage of it than I do. Do, are there really more buzzer beaters and last second shots this time of year, or do we just see them all? Like, it depends. Like some years, there's not as many early, you know, early rounds. Like it, it, it depends. Yeah, yeah. This is. It was like the championship week. It was like one every night. Yeah, 
I think it's just I think it's just there's so much riding on them that when when they go in, like everybody shares it and it goes viral. Everybody sees it because I mean, look, it's it's winner go home, man. Every game is a game seven. Once you get to this point of the year, well, again, it's more right. than that, right? It's it's what's at stake for everybody. Mm-hmm. Notre it's Dame actually- flies out to San Diego now. Mike Bray can be on the beach tomorrow at noon. Can be, will be, will be. <laughs> look at that's that. why. Look at, look at that. That's why. That's why he's got that big old smile on his face right now. Bray's the best. <laughs> I mean, he's honestly, like- is there? When you're talking about the most likable guys in the sport, Mike. He's a great dude. He's a great dude. And he's I don't know him that well, but I've been yeah. around him enough. But you never heard anything. Have you ever heard anything bad about Mike Ray? Never. That, and that's never. how you know, right? Like, because, you know, in, in this sport, there's a lot of shit talking behind people's backs. There is a lot. We're like children, right? Whether it's media, coaches, and you you don't hear a damn thing about Mike Ray ever. Never. Never. I'll tell you what. And I'll say this to anybody. I got you. We got you on here, but I can say the same thing about you. Not not one word. I have never heard anybody say one bad word about you, Mike Point, in this sport. And one enough. <laughs> <laughs> that could be true. That could be true. <laughs> not yet, anyway. Right? Good answer. Good. Very good answer. Dagan, what do we got? Not a ton going on right now. Obviously, a lot of people talking about that game winner. Yeah, um, yeah. going on there in the chat. Uh, let me go back and see what I can find. You guys can can keep chatting it up while I, while I look. All right, I, I I got I got a question, uh, Doster. Do you think I'm, yeah. I'm going to get any shift from the Arkansas fans tomorrow? Wow, what did you do? You just, you know, the Arkansas fans are not big fans of my Mike because. Uh, oh, I that's said, right. They're in Buffalo, dude, aren't they? They're, they're here. Si- they're going to have signs for you. Yeah. Is, I, Mama, I mean, is Mama Hog there? Oh, no. do you know about oh, do you know I, about Mama Hog? Do you know about Mama Hog, Mike? I don't. So one of the guys on our field at 12 site, his name is Clint Sterner. He is from, uh, I don't know, I don't know where, somewhere, somewhere in Texas um, where the accent is really thick. Let's just put it like that. It's right? really thick. And, really thick. And, he played. He played football at Arkansas. So um, his mom is obviously a big Arkansas fan because her baby boy went there. Right. And she uh, and and like her baby boy, she's from a part of Texas where the accent is really thick. And uh, Goodman had the audacity to get on Twitter earlier this year and say that Arkansas was overrated. They should not be a top twenty-five team. They weren't going to go to the tournament. Eric Musselman was. He was. He was a complete fraud. Like Goodman. Goodman went in. I never said that about Musselman. I never said that. <laughs> Don't be putting words out there that, that aren't true. I did say that they were not a top 25 team. They didn't deserve to be a top 25 team at the time. Played a, played a soft non-conference schedule. And, and, again, at the time, and that's what people don't understand, sometimes at the time they're not. And then Musselman made a couple lineup changes. He actually went big. And Arkansas went on a damn run that nobody expected, probably including Musk. And uh, man, those fans—they're out of their minds. I mean, they are crazy. It's like, deal, man. oh, Arkansas, Texas Tech, Providence—they all kind of hated me. I flipped Texas Tech. I, I'm good with now. Like, I want Texas Tech they, to get they to love the final you. four. They do. They, they love you now. Yeah, you're a huge yeah. Texas. Like, you may be more popular in Lubbock than you are in your own house. I might move to Lubbock. <laughs> I might move to Lubbock. I don't you're know how long I'll last, but yeah, exactly. I'm not sure how long I'll last. Hey, what? I've, I've been to Stillwater a couple of times, Mike. Yeah. How would you describe Stillwater to people that have, like, Doster's never been to Stillwater. How would you That's describe not, that is That is decidedly not true. You've been so to Stillwater? Went, yeah, I went to an Oklahoma State game in 2012 on our road trip. I did a, I I did a doubleheader. I did a doubleheader. I saw Oral Roberts play in the morning, and then I saw an Oklahoma State night game. Right. against. I stand corrected. When, when, Frank Martin, when Frank Martin was still at Kansas State, it was Travis Ford against Frank Martin. Small there was, town Midwest, man. Like this is it's a college town. How does a Brooklyn guy though? How does a Brooklyn guy make it in Stillwater? Well, I tell people this all the time. The best thing about for me to about coming to Oklahoma State is I came here from the smallest town in Texas. Right. right. The place where we were in Texas, Nacogdoches, you could fit four right. of them inside Stillwater. <laughs> <laughs> So How we got to Stillwater. My wife is like, "Wow, this place is huge." <laughs> <laughs> you got more than two stoplights, right? 
Right. Is, is she from New York too? No, she's from Michigan. She played volleyball at Virginia Tech. Uh, got a master's at Florida, and then uh, and now she, you know, she's a dietitian. So she's an athlete. We got. Uh, so she, I was gonna say she's the athlete in the family. She is. She is. <laughs> she is. We got a nine year old boy who's gonna be probably about I don't know, six eight, and then a six year old girl. She you know, pretty two two pretty good athletes. Was it was it a culture shock though when you went from South Carolina to to Stephen F? Yeah, huge. Yeah. Yeah, my marriage almost didn't last. <laughs> I was like, "What's going on here?" This is no no lie. Uh, the first probably week, and th- this hadn't happened. This, this you guys are married, you know. I had been there probably three months before she moved. The first week she's there, we're driving from our house to Walmart. We see a horse walking in the road, like, and my wife's looking at me like. Like, what's that about? Like, is that real? Like, <laughs> just a random, like, what? Horse walking by itself yeah. on a regular street that we drive on? Like, <laughs> was this a regular occurrence? <laughs> yes, it was like normal. Come man. on. Like, this happened a lot? Yeah, it was no, like, it was. Damn. I've never been. Wow, I've never man. been. Great people down there. Yeah, yeah. Well, prepared you they for love still hoops. water. They love hoops. Let me. My, I got a question for you. How hard is how hard is this turnaround um, when you're when you're playing games? I, it's going to be extra difficult for the teams playing in the first four. Like Notre Dame, sure. they got to go sure. get on their flight. They're probably not going to get on a flight until like two a.m. Central Time. They got to get all the way out to San Diego. They probably won't land until like eight a.m., nine a.m. They got a game at four fifteen on Friday afternoon. Um, I don't think you've played. Have you played in the first four? It's 11. No, it's 11. It's 11, 15. They got to go to San Diego. They'll do. They at least they gain three hours. Or they'll right? do media two hours. They'll gain two, two hours. hours. Two hours. They'll do me- no, no. What? They're in Dayton. They're in Dayton. That's East Coast. Right? Yeah. East Coast. Shit, it's midnight. Yeah. 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 Oh, my gosh. No, that's. It's bad. Yeah. Those I, kids. Wow. They better sleep on the floor. But yeah, no, that's that's uh that's gonna be hard. But that that's where Mike Bray's positivity will will help. Oh yeah, they won't, they, I would imagine they won't do much of anything tomorrow. <laughs> you know, just watch film. I hope they don't have any media obligations in in San Diego. In San Diego, um, and I would hope they play a late game on Friday. I would hope. No, they probably, 15. I wonder if they do have media obligations. Play, they play the 415, 415. Indiana plays a late game. Indiana had the same issue. They didn't leave until 3 a.m. last night. They got a oh. 720 game in Portland. They had to fly out to the West Coast. Wow. It's tough. Yeah, I wish they kept them a little closer. I wish they had one of these, you know, one of these teams going Midwest. Like that, that kind of bothers me. That bothers me with this. Yeah, sure. I mean, there's a way to do that. Surely there's a way to I mean that's what I'm saying. You know the games are in Dayton. Why don't you just make the bracket where those teams aren't traveling? Yeah, right. Two of them have to. Go across the country. I don't get it. I don't get that. Go put them in Indy. Right, right. state's got to go to right state's got to go to San Diego. So, so they're got, all. You have three of the four teams going to go the West, West Coast from Dayton. Yeah, right. So it's got to go to San Diego, and then what was the? Where does uh? Let me check on um. Fort Worth. Texas Southern. Fort Worth. Texas Fort Worth. Southern is going to Fort, Fort Worth. Worth. Okay. Hmm. That's yeah, so I mean, pretty far. Could, why not put somebody in Indy or what? What, what are the other close to Dayton? What else is Milwaukee? No, Milwaukee. Pittsburgh. No. Pittsburgh, Milwaukee. Buffalo yeah. ain't that far. Yeah, send them to me. Be speaking, I'll bring them coffee in the morning. <laughs> Dunkin' Donuts. So, got a bunch of dun- I, so much better being here. By the way, there's an the indie site too, isn't there? Isn't it? What's that? The games the indie. Yeah, that's where they should have yeah. sent them. Right. Totally yeah. should have sent them there. What? Hey, what's your your favorite your favorite NCAA tournament site you've ever uh, been at, Mike? Uh, probably Indy. You talking about just for just Final for, Four? You didn't even say Indy. Final Four. Where Where would you want the Final Four every year? If you could have it somewhere every year, probably Indy. Yeah, San Antonio's good. You don't like New Orleans too much? Yeah, when I was about twenty eight, I did. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. I hear you. 
I hear you. Now it's a little tougher to, okay. to rebound. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little For tougher it, to rebound, isn't it? In in New Orleans? Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 tough in the cities that don't tell you there's a certain time you got to go home. Right. <laughs> All right, I got another question for you. Ready? This is a good one. Give me your favorite AAU story ever. Oh, yeah, here we go. My All favorite right. AAU story ever. Man, there's a lot of them. So, so I grew up in an era where New York City basketball was really good. Yeah. I played for Riverside Church, and the guys who were older than I that played in the program were Elton Brand, Ron Artest, Wow. Eric Barkley, like, like really, really good dude. Like yep. guys who were going to play. And so we were young when they were good. I'll tell the two stories. One of, of Ron Artest losing his mind and, and literally throwing a, like, he's like 16 years old. He throws a whole water cooler on the court. Cause they took him out of the game. Yeah. Did he really? He was out of his mind. He was out of his mind. I think they were playing like, what, which one of the Rush brothers would have lined up with him? Jerron? Uh, yeah, Jerron was the oldest, he right? Was the old, he was the yeah. oldest, right? Yes. And then yes. Kareem and Brandon was the youngest. Yeah, so they're like going at it uh, back when those guys, and, and he gets taken out of the game and throws the water cooler on the court. <laughs> but the craziest one that I've, that I've witnessed, and it has nothing to do with a basketball game. We go to Phoenix, Arizona, when I'm like 15 years old, and my coach is named Kenny Pretlow. I don't know if you know him or not. Yeah, I know so Kenny. I know Kenny well. So... It is 150 degrees. <laughs> I mean, maybe an exaggeration, but maybe not. And we're beating some team really bad. And we come off, he takes me and O'Cook and, you know, Willie Shaw out of the game. And he's got tape on his eyeglasses, like a big wad of, like, <laughs> tape that you put on, like, an ankle. Like, what the hell happened? Apparently, his glasses literally melted <laughs> like, like the corner part where it, it, like his glasses melted on his face <laughs> that's pretty good but man there's all kinds of crazy stories we're down what about as a coach what about as a coach that you've seen what's the craziest thing like i remember seeing one year leonard washington almost squared up with somebody mid-court and kevin o'neill had to go down and like 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 get them out of there, break it up. I mean, I've seen some crazy shit. Darius Washington's dad in a fight in the stands at ABCD throwing haymakers. Like, really? oh, th yeah, there's been some, I mean, so many, so many. The wildest scene that I've seen was the uh, Lonzo Ball Zion deal. I literally left. I left. Really? Couldn't, couldn't they, move, right? I heard you couldn't it move. It was a circus. Yeah, shit show. I don't even know if they actually played a real basketball game. It I was, was in Italy it was, then. I it was barely, it was barely a real basket because it, I mean, it was also at like eleven o'clock yes. Vegas time. Because yes. I remember I, my NBC editors were like, "You need to stay up and watch this game and write because this is what everybody it was it was trending on everything." They had like four hundred thousand people watching a live stream on Facebook, and my editor was like, "You need to write something off of this." So I'm sitting there. It's two o'clock in the morning watching a fucking live stream of Lonzo Ball and Zion it Williams. Lamello. Play. It was LaMelo. Uh, right? LaMelo, yeah, LaMelo. LaMelo. Play, play right. pickup. Yeah. It was it was, it was, was just playing pickup basketball. It was horrible. I was like, why am I doing this? That was yeah, it was, it was awful. Can I, can I tell you mine, Mike? Yeah, yeah, and I got one, I got one for you that, that will give you a I, pretty good idea I, how good, business works. Good, Goodman's heard this story before, but um, Dewan Wagner, he came up about the same time you did, right? Yeah, he was yeah. in Camden he, when he, you were in New York. Right. Yeah, yeah. My, my AAU team <laughs> – we had a pretty good AU team. We had, we had some D1 guys on it, a guy that went to LaSalle, a guy that went to Northeastern, a uh, guy that went to Marist. Uh, we played his AAU team when you were at a tournament in, I think it was, it was Villano, one of those hoop group ones. I can't remember where, what school it was at. It might have been West Virginia. And he, he we were all excited. We're playing Dewan Wagner's team. He doesn't show up for the first half. And we're like, what, what what's going on? Like, we're hanging with him a little bit too. Like, we're down by like 10 at the half. Um, playing pretty well. He shows up at halftime. He's got just like, he's got the Tim's on untied and the jean shorts. He takes off the jean shorts. He's got his basketball shorts on underneath. Um, throws on his basketball shoes, throws on the, uh, the reversible jersey, comes out, and in the first 10 minutes of the second half scores 35. They're up 30 on us. He checks himself out of the game, changes before the game's over, and he's gone <laughs> before the final buzzer. And I'm like, I'm like, you know what? Ba this, this basketball thing, I don't think this is going to work out for me. I got to find something thing, else. To the do. best thing about it, you have that story to tell, man. That's yeah. Right. That's right. <laughs> so I'll tell you this one from a coach's standpoint. This, again, there's levels to all this stuff. 
So I'm at South Carolina. Uh, Darren is the head coach. Darren Horn is down, down Northern Kentucky. And, you know, we had worked really hard to try to keep the best kids in the state. In the state. When you got South Carolina, you got to do that, right? So we're recruiting this kid named Bryce Johnson from Orangeburg, South Carolina. It was us, mm-hmm. Clemson, and Florida early on. Like, really skinny, like, good, good, good touch. And um, going into his senior year, he hadn't really been on the radar. He was playing with a local South Carolina team, the South Carolina Ravens, and they were just okay. Like, no one was really paying attention to them. They had Devin Downey a, a few years before that. Yeah. And, you know, they were good, but they, they had kind of fallen off the map. So, so the guy who runs the program gets convinced to let his two best players – I can't remember the second kid, but I know Bryce Johnson was one of them – let them play for CP3, okay? So Bryce is now going to play with Chris Paul's team, and now he's on the team that everybody's watching. And so we're talking about this in staff meetings and we're like, well, we got to make sure we're at every game. Got to be full staff. We got to, you know, this kid, we got to have. And the same year that Bryce was coming out, Dewan Coleman was coming out. He was playing for Albany City Rocks. North Carolina was recruiting Dewan Coleman heavily, them in Syracuse, right? So you guys know how the PCM courts are set up. If you come in one of the gyms, you got to walk across the baseline to get to the other side, unless you go all the way around. So Roy Williams walks in the wrong gym. DeWan Coleman's playing on the next court. So he comes in, he realizes he's at the wrong place. He's going to walk across the baseline. Well, in about a two-minute span of him being in the gym, he couldn't cross because the game was going on. Oh, no. So he had to stop. And Bryce Johnson has, like, five blocks, <laughs> like two tip dunks. <laughs> <laughs> and Roy Williams <laughs> sits down. Oh no. <laughs> and you're watching him. And, and you're watching I'm, him sit down. What am I? Oh no. <laughs> I kind of I nudge Darren because he's locked in on the game. <laughs> I'm like, hey, you're like, hey, over there. I think Roy just sat down to watch. Um, we got some problems. <laughs> he, had never, right? he had never been to North Carolina. He, he was a, actually grew up a Florida fan, as crazy as it sounds. Grew quiet kid. He was a quiet yeah, kid. Super quiet. Yeah. Yeah. So we had, he had been on our campus probably 15 times. He was from 30 oh. minutes away. That tournament ended on a Sunday. He visited North Carolina the next day. He never came back to Columbia. <laughs> that was it. That was it. No shot. No, those are, those are cool stories. Those are very, very like, not for you, but those are cool no, stories. No. It might be All right, we're we're, we're going to let you go. You. We 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 appreciate everything you've we done. We gotta we gotta do we gotta do three cheers. We gotta do our cheers. We gotta do All our right, three well, cheers. Well, I got a water. All I got is water. Yeah, so, so it's we just our three cheers. We do it every night at the end of the night. You toast to something. You cheers to something. Uh, normally, it's a player or a game that happened during that day. There were only two games today, so uh, you could do. Mike, I'm giving you the ability to to cheers whatever you want to right now. So I'm gonna let Jeff go first while you think about it a little bit. All right. I mean, it's easy for me. You got to cheer Mike Bray, don't you? And and it sucks that I don't have a beer here. I probably do over at the fridge. Hold on. I'm going to look. I, I, I've been sipping on mine the whole show. I might have a fridge over here. I'm going to look. Yeah. I'm gonna see what I got. There's nothing in there. Nothing. <laughs> at, least you're, at least you're not getting cold pizza right you didn't now. You did stock yeah. your room for the weekend, man? What's up with that? that? I, listen, I flew in from Vegas. I've been ripping and running here. I got some wings last <laughs> night. I just got back to the hotel. I went over and saw Greg Paulus and his kids. So I yeah I haven't I haven't really been in this room much but um, I'm 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 gonna toast to Mike Bray with water Mike and Bray. we'll pretend we'll pretend it's vodka uh, Mike hell of a hell of a win a lot of people were saying you should retire before this year and uh, you know what if you retire after this year at least you went out with an NCAA tournament appearance but hopefully you don't retire because college basketball needs more people like Mike Bray mm-hmm. Mike go ahead. Yeah, I don't have anything. I wasn't prepared for this, and we're rookie. Man, I'll be better <laughs> next time. But I'm going to cheers to two things. One, to the best day on the sports calendar, opening day of the NCAA tournament, right? That's it's good. upon us. Yeah. It's great. Uh, with that same thing in mind, I'm going to cheers to Oklahoma State having the postseason band behind it. And a year from now, me being prepared go. to go play a game with my team. Love uh, it next year so thank you guys you did a hell of a job hell of a job this year mike uh ncaa screwed you 
completely. Hold and- on. Can you, hold on. Hold Can I do my cheers first? <laughs> all right. All right. Can, can all I right. do my cheers? First, first, Mike has the audacity to seal my cheers about having to be the first day of the tournament because it's after midnight. So one, that's a problem. Because two, Mike, my toast is going to be to Mike Boynton right. because of the uh, yeah, the yeah. the performance that you had this season. You guys got fucked. I'll say it. You don't have to say it. That's Rob Doster saying it. We've you can all quote said me it. on that one. Yeah, yeah. You got fucked by the NCAA. Uh, you know how I feel about the situation. You know how I feel about the job that you did this year. Um, and you guys played hard, man. It, it's a testament to the program that you have and the culture that you've built and the players that you recruited that your guys busted their ass for the entire season. It was fun to watch. I am happy that it's behind you. Uh, so to Mike Boyton, to Oklahoma state moving forward, let's get to the NCAA tournament next year. So we can watch you on the first day of the tournament, the greatest day of the year. But listen, this has been the field of 68 after dark. So for stadium insider, Jeff Goodman for Oklahoma state head coach, Mike Boyton and for our producer behind the scenes, the one and only Dagan Hughes. My name is Rob Dosser. This has been the field of 68 after dark. See you guys tomorrow, 11 o'clock. Later.